Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. Uh, this is day three of Tailhook 25. We're out here in Reno at the Grand Sierra Resort. And my guest back again this year is Vice Admiral Dan Cheever. He is the Air Boss, Commander Naval Air Forces, and Commander Naval Air Forces Pacific. Um, Admiral, welcome back. Thank you very much. Great to be here with you. And, and thank you for writing for the uh, July issue of Proceedings. Uh, if you haven't read it yet, Admiral Cheever's article is about naval aviation today. 25 years in the future, so 2020, 2050, and also uh, 2075. So I thought we'd just start with aircraft carriers because a lot of what naval aviation does is aircraft carrier based, right? So uh, right now, while we while we talk here, uh, USS Nimitz CBN 68 is about 50 years old and on her scheduled final deployment. So how's that going? When is she uh, uh, planning to come back? It's going great, and I think about what was first on that aircraft carrier and what's on it now and the capability and capacity. It's, it's immense, and it makes me think what's on today will be completely different uh, in 50 years from now, and that's the flexibility, adaptability, but also the sovereignty of the aircraft carriers. One of the most important aspects of it, because we only need the president's permission to do whatever we want around the globe, and that is a unique and uh, beneficial aspect of the aircraft carrier but it's going great the young men and women war fighting is good they can win uh war fighters they're fantastic better than we were they're more talented they're more tech smart and they they really know what they're doing and i think thanks to our training and our unique training systems we really have them going well and you have to evolve and you have to keep pace in this new environment and that's exactly what the aircraft carrier does right. and so it's a continuous growth growth process through the years. Gotcha. Yeah, I think about my first deployment, 1992 U.S. Independence. The things that we had then compared to the things we have now, yep. whole systems, training, uh, weapons, platforms, completely different capability and capacity. It's, uh, it's pretty phenomenal. What were you flying in 1992? I was an F-18 Charlie. Uh, first deployment, I was a uh, forward deployed naval force over in Japan on the USS Independence out of Atsugi. And it was uh, mostly uh, basic missiles, rockets, and bombs, that kind of thing. Gotcha. And now it's just completely different. So uh, Nimitz, towards the end of her life, and we've got Ford is uh, in the water, been on deployment a couple times now. And uh, JFK is the next Ford-class carrier coming. Yep. Um, a little bit delayed. How are, how are things going with the Ford-class? Uh, yeah. You know, is, is that program going to get sort of back up to speed? What do you, what do you anticipate? That's what we have to have happen. It's got to get up to speed. We have to have that delivered uh, because the capability and capacity, especially capacity of the Ford class, completely different than the Nimitz class. Uh, and the capacity, those unique aircraft elevators and some of the other things uh, make it uh, just a completely different aircraft carrier that can win in the future and today. Got it. Uh, let's talk aircraft a little bit. Uh, we'll start with trainers. So T-45, Airs Fleury in uh, 1991 in uh, Navy squadrons. Uh, so that's the advanced jet trainer. Uh, so you, if you're going to fly F-18s or F-35s, you come through the T-45. There were some problems with the T-45 five, six years ago, right? Uh, seemed to be back uh, up on step. Uh, but as I walk around the floor here at Tailhook, there's a number of companies that are vying to build the replacement for the T-45. So what, what does the Navy want in the next advanced jet trainer? Well, I think we're in the process right now where we're excited to accept all the proposals from industry okay. of how they think they can best train us. What I'm most interested in is the speed of the acquisition and then the sustainment of the aircraft system. And then a little bit of the how are we going to train our air crew in the future smarter, more effectively, and efficiently uh, to do what we need to do. And there's a lot of different vendors who are interested. Uh, and I think those proposals will come in and then the team. We'll look through all those proposals to see what's best. Yeah, when when is the down select expected? Uh, I'm not sure the exact date of the down select, but it's coming quick. Uh, we're going to get all this all this going quickly, but the T45 will be around for a while. Yep. to keep training our folks. Uh, so the maintenance of those and the training has to continue as we as we do the initial uh, parts of this. And last year we talked about uh, so the T45s. If you're, um, so student naval aviators are no longer going to the boat, mm. carrier calling in the T-45. So uh, ex except in, uh, for the E-2s. If I... e E-2s. E-2s don't have the same system. Right. Uh, that's a trickier thing. Yep. 
And the first time I flew in an E2, I actually had to use my feet on the rudders. Yeah. Because, yeah, so it's a trickier plane. Uh, the uh, Super Hornet, the Growler, and the Lightning II, Joint Strike Fighter, they all have precision landing modes. Right. And so uh, we've discovered that we can train quicker and not have to go to the carrier for those platforms. Yep. So the replacement for the T-45 then, will it not have to go to the boat? In other words, will it not have to have? It won't have to. Okay. Uh, your article mentioned the uh, MQ-25. So that's unmanned, the Stingray unmanned uh, tanker. Yep. It's supposed to get rid of the uh, both the mission and the recovery tanker role for the Super Hornets. Um, and you said in your article, we'll fly this year, start flight tests uh, this year. So that that uh, program has been talked about for quite some time. Yeah. Uh, it took a while to get here. Uh, you still think it's going to fly this year? So I know it was here. Super excited for it. We need it to fly in 2025 then get on the aircraft carrier in 26 and really ring it out because this is what unlocks the future of manned on man teaming for the aircraft carrier. It's the air wing of the future. It allows us to think about things like collaborative combat aircraft, the manned on man system on the carrier that controls it and all those kind of things, uh, and really teaming manned on man on an aircraft carrier in a very small area, as you know, on the aircraft carrier. So very excited about it. And I'm equally excited about the strike fighters all returning to their strike fighter missions instead of having to do tanking and strike fighter missions because that really does free up way more capacity uh, for the commanders out there. And I think that's the most exciting part of this. And then there's there's a lot of pieces of this uh, unmanned thing that are very exciting and I think are going to go very quickly once we unlock the keys to that man to unmanned teaming on the aircraft carrier. So if, if you advance forward, you know, a couple of years now from now, hopefully uh, all the air wings will have MQ-25 for that tanker mission. Uh, advance forward another maybe 10 years. What I'm getting at is, uh, you know, what we're seeing in uh, that the, the Ukraine war, right? There's so many unmanned systems and a varying size from manned portable, launchable, all the way up to almost the size of an MQ-25. Um, where where do you see that happening for naval aviation and, and aircraft carriers? Do you see, you know, uh, the the small attritable systems coming for naval aviation? Yeah, I think it's a combination of everything. I think fourth, fifth, sixth generation aircraft, collaborative combat aircraft, smaller, larger, uh, and how they plug and play and what their role is. And then you have to get to the cost piece of it. You don't want to you don't want to have things that are so costly uh, that that you can't afford it. So it's got to all be in there. And I think we're on the right road for the mix of the air wing of the future. And I'm pretty excited about where we're going because I think the unmanned piece is going to unlock quickly, a lot more quickly than folks think. Got it. And I'm, I think the administration, uh, SecNav, SecDep, the, the folks who are in charge really understand the speed and velocity of acquisition required for this type of environment. So I'm real excited about where we're going. You're right about 2075, which is a little hard to see from 2025, right? It is. Um, but you know, you, you in the article, you mentioned a little bit about directed energy weapons, about uh, you know the future uh, aircraft systems, the manned on man teaming, the CCA, collaborative combat aircraft. So you know, what are you starting to see the blurry you know outlines of uh, for Air Wing 2075 and naval aviation 50 years from now? Yeah, I think the important thing is the carriers we're building right now will be around in 2075 yeah. and com look completely different on what's on them. Uh, I think about quantum computing, direct energy, electromagnetic spectrum, unmanned things, and the whole, the whole nine yards. And I think the key to that is uh, nobody really has the vision to 20, 2075 right, of what exactly the threat environment's going to be. So what has to be possible is an acquisition cycle that's quick enough to keep up with the changes and then what's the most significant thing uh, that you acquire as you go along, plus the training that has to be behind all that. So you, you bring up a good point about the acquisition system. What are some things that need to change in that system, right? And, uh, you know, there, and there's, a, there's a, you know, congressional military industrial complex. It, it's a Rubik's Cube. You move one side and it, you know, it impacts the others. But, you know, what are some things that at your level, uh, the, the conversations about, hey, we're, we really need to transmogrify yeah. this process so that we can move faster? Yeah, I'm pretty excited because you're seeing things like the Rapid Capabilities Office come into the Navy. 
uh, some things like that. And I think the administration really is behind getting the cycle down to what matters. Uh, and how you do that is your team with industry who has it. You team with universities, you team with the whole thing. And then you get a system where you can uh, fast track some things, the most consequential things. And then the longer lead items may go through a little longer process, but also significant uh, as you acquire them. And, and I'm pretty excited with where we are right now. I'm sensing the, I'm sensing the environment is changing to make it all possible. Okay. Okay. I, this is just a, a Bill Hamlet editorial comment, but you know, from my perspective, uh, one of the the major problems of the current system is just getting budgets passed on time and a consistency of funding lines, so that you know industry can predict, uh, active duty can predict. Here's what we want, and then it's not you know, oh well, we're riding this uh, you know slope that's constantly changing, right? Yeah, we'll deal with whatever comes, but certainly the persistence uh, and the predictability is absolutely helpful for everybody out there. So we're excited. We're excited for the journey, and I'm personally excited for where we are right now Good. Uh, with with this uh, this whole discussion. Okay. Oh, last question. Yeah. What would you hear from the JOs yesterday? Uh, the junior officers. A couple takeaways. Smarter than I ever was. All right. Insightful. I got about 20 to 30 different topics that I'm, I need to work on for them. They give me such good insight into the granularity at the local level of issues that are happening. I look at what's happened with all the deployed carriers, our expeditionary force with P-8s and uh, the helicopter teams. And I see these young folks. They're smart. They're resilient. They understand rules of engagement. They get out there and they make it happen. Uh, and then they come back to us and iterate with us on how do we fix the training? What's a better way uh, to treat them and to make them or to allow them to learn faster? Is that's what they're really after. They want to be as as best they can be, and they want to be they want to learn fast. And I see that all the way down to the junior enlisted folks. You know, a two hour PowerPoint presentation is not working right for an eighteen year old today. No. A sixty second video that gets across to them. Uh, I'll give a lot of credit to the Navy. They just changed the um, run, hide, fight training Heck. to a four and a half minute video. Last year, it took me 48 minutes to complete it. The four and a half minute video, I completely understood my role and the whole role of everybody in that. And it was a fantastic uh, training evolution. And I, my sense is we can get all that training down to about 60 seconds and it continually update these young folks because that's how they learn. I mean, you know, before seven o'clock in the morning, they've you'd learned 100, 200 things and they're quick at it. And so I'm excited about that journey. And this industry team that comes to Tailhook that we team with, which is the glory of Tailhook, is we get to team with this folks at the Grand Sierra. And then we get to talk to the folks who came before us, talk to the families and really find out how we do this thing better. And the camaraderie that comes along with this is the whole the whole reason we're here. Nice. And it's fantastic. So I'm excited about the learning that's happening. Okay. Any parting shots? Uh, party Josh, thanks for what you do. Uh, you know, the article was a little about peace, crisis response, and the full-up combat, and then the three time epics. And I think, I think where we are today, we're on the right track. And I, I'm really confident in where we're going uh, and really excited to be here. Awesome. Thanks for your time. Well, Airboss, thanks again for being on the show. Hey, everybody. Until next episode, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.